And that is, uh, why can't we make them see? That's what we're going to look at here. We've just read uh, Romans, uh, one part of uh, chapter 1, and it kind of gives you a glimpse into why we can't make the evolutionists see things our way. Now, when gospel singer Mark Lowry was asked if he believed in evolution, his answer was this. He said, I do not have enough faith to believe in evolution. And he went on to say, if you took the, a watch apart and you took all its, its intricate uh, workings there and all, all the, the mechanisms and you took them all completely apart and you put them in a bag, he went on to say, and you twisted it up and you got that bag and you shook that bag with all those parts for a billion years. He said, and then you open up that bag. He said, what are the chances that you're going to have that timepiece restored to the way it was, keeping perfect time. Of course, the answer is, it would never happen. It would never happen. And that's exactly what evolutionists are saying did happen. That somehow, some, some miraculous way, although they wouldn't use the word uh, miraculous, all the elements got together and then they, boom, they, the, big bang, uh, the big bang, they expanded in such a fast way that all of a sudden out of that chaos came order and it all shook around and then we have us today. And I got thinking, within about one minute, that uh, gospel singer summed it all up. He adequately supported creationism, and he made mincemeat out of evolutionism. What was bothering me was this. If the solution is so simple, why can't we make evolutionists see our side of the story? And today, I want us to look and take a few minutes and examine it. Now, tonight, we're going to look at some examples of where evolutionists have gone wrong and uh, why I'm, I'm totally against evolution. But this morning, we're going to look at, at, at three problems that I have with evolution. And the first thing we're going to look at here, uh, with the problems of evolution, is that this theory here has major holes in it. And some implications are really incompatible with the Christian viewpoint that's put out in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, it, it's just, it doesn't seem to work. And now one of the major problems I have with evolution is this. Evolution cannot account for life emerging from non-life. And yet that's what they say happens. Now if I get this thing to go to the next slide. Oh, I'm Somebody help me here, gentlemen. Can you put it back one? Thank you. All right. One of the problems is, is that they say that life evolved out of something that was never alive. We have biological uh, entities that came out of inanimate objects. And that's a, a claim that they have to, to stick to if their theory is to hold any water. Now, it, it's not enough to say that life has evolved from, from an amoeba to a human. Somehow, somehow evolutionists must account for the emergence of non-life and then it evolving into something that was living. It's called, uh, what we believe in is biogenesis or biogenesis. We believe that only living things can produce living things. That makes sense. You know, if, you, if you're going to see a dog, the dog has to be alive and it bears puppies and, it, and they're alive. Only life can produce living things. But evolutionists believe in abiogenesis. In other words, they believe that somewhere along the line, billions of years ago, or in the case of the earth here, millions of years ago, something amazing happened. Something like a rock or a mineral or some elements were struck by something, like maybe an electrical field or something, and out of non-life came life. And that's what they hold to. They start you off about 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang, and then while your head's still spinning with that big number, they fast forward you to about four and a half million years ago with the earth, and they keep saying, somehow, somehow we get from a big bang with all these elements and, and this stuff, these rocks and things, and all of a sudden you've got life forming. You've got an, an amoeba started. There's a problem with that, and that is that it has never been witnessed. It has never been seen in science ever before. Now, back in the 19th century, they used to believe it did happen. They, used to, they had this, uh, this uh, belief frequently, uh, it was called spontaneous generation. And what they did is they 
uh, observed maggots and mold being formed out of organic material that was left uh, out, in the, out in the open. So if you had some, some gooey, ooey stuff and you left it out there on the table, what people would see a few hundred years ago, they'd look at it, and after a little while, you see these little maggots growing out of it. And you see mold forming, and they said, you see, there was something here that wasn't alive, and all of a sudden it produced life. Well, over the years, through science, it's been disproven. You find that a lot of that stuff was already there, well, it was all already there before, and it just sprung up. And so this, this idea that non-life produces life has been exposed. It's fake. It doesn't work. And yet, somehow, evolutionists have to account for it. They kind of skip over it, though, don't they? You don't hear them bringing that up too often. They like to talk about billions and billions of years ago when the star systems were, were forming. And then they like, to, as I said before, they like to fast forward you to the point where, you know, lower life forms are, are producing higher life forms. But you have to hold them back and say, well, no, wait a minute. And we're going to look at this tonight. You have to challenge evolutionists. You have to say, where did you ever see? Where has science ever has ever shown that out of non-life you have life and they must admit we've never seen that so I put to you this morning who is more religious us or the evolutionists it takes a lot of faith as Mark Lowry had said it takes a lot of faith a lot of blind faith to believe in evolution because we don't see it we don't see it in science so I have that problem with them I have another problem with them and that is Evolution cannot account for personality emerging from non-personality. Do you folks have personality? Some of you have too much personality. It's, it's oozing out of you. We have personality. Well, evolutionists have to account for that. They say, how, how can, again, how can these lower life forms, uh, how can an amoeba, how can bacteria, how can these single-celled organisms which have no personality, how can you just... Let them go for millions and millions and millions of years, and just poof, we have personality. It's not seen. It's not witnessed in science anywhere. And yet that's what they claim. Now the Bible says Adam and Eve were made as rational or personal beings from a triune God. See, our God has personality, doesn't he? He exists in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We have three persons. He has personality. Our God with personality was able to create man, the ultimate creation, and to give us personality. Why? Because he had personality. A person, uh, you know, like myself, well, I'll use somebody else, anybody else, could actually build something like this pulpit. Maybe I couldn't. But somebody could put together, somebody with personality could put in, uh, together an inanimate object but it can't be done the other way around, can it? You can't have an inanimate object. You can't have something like, like a pulpit. You can't have something like an amoeba, something that low down there with no personality at all, produce somebody with personality. It doesn't work. It doesn't, logically, it doesn't even make sense. <coughs> Excuse me. The only person that could create somebody with personality is somebody who already has got it themselves, and our God has it. And yet evolutionists say, and they skim over this, and they, they say, well, I guess it just happened. No, man is trying to do it. They're trying to do it with computers, aren't they? We're trying to link computers together. We're trying to <clears throat> give them their own personality so they can speak with each other. And they do. They communicate with each other. They communicate with man. But they only do so as they are programmed to do. There's a saying with computers, and that is, garbage in, garbage out. That means they only do what you program them to do. We have amazing robots. Canada, by the way, is our pioneers in robot technology. We're one of the best in, the in all the nations of the world pr producing our, our robots. <clears throat> and yet, they don't have personality. Or they can move around and they can say, how are you today, in a mechanical voice. But they have no personality. And by personality, I mean this. They don't have a mind. They don't have a will of their own. And they don't have emotions. I'm glad some of these things don't have emotions. We'd be in big trouble, but they don't. So they can't, there's, there's a couple problems here I have with this. Is that they don't have, you don't see life being produced from non-life. You don't see something with personality being produced by something that doesn't have personality. And then finally, here's something I have a really big problem with. And that is 
and it's one of the most disturbing facts about evolutionary theory, and that is the inherent racism that it has. Now, I'm not accusing any individual evolutionist of being a racist. I'm not doing that. But what I am saying is that the evolutionist view, <clears throat> if they're held consistent, some may believe that eventually, one day, a strain of human life will evolve beyond the rest of human life and take over its superiority. I don't know about you, but that scares me. And yet, we have most of the people in our government systems, in our educational systems, are hardened evolutionists. And if you are to believe evolution, survival of the fittest, that means some nation, some group of people, some ethnic people must rise, must, according to their theory, rise to the forefront and take over. And that's scary. Adolf Hitler dedicated two chapters of his book, Mein Kampf, to the theory of evolution. And we saw what happened there. Although most evolutionists today reject the past influences of this theory, which is known sometimes called social Darwinism, the biological implications cannot be ignored. The survival of the fittest means that even strains within the human race must strive and go higher, and those who are weak must not survive. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad we got the gospel? I tell you, if the evolutionists were in charge, they would just let people die by the wayside. You're not going to see a lot of atheistic organizations over there in Haiti building up that country and supporting that country. You know what it is? It's that, <clears throat> that, that false religion of atheism that got them in the messes that they've been in. and They, they have such a weak structure. Praise God for the United States and Canada and other nations who have Christian organizations, have a Christian background, who show mercy to people who need it. I'm very glad that Bethel Baptist Church, we have a special uh, classes for people who aren't as strong as other people. Because you're not going to find that in evolutionism. They don't believe that. Only survival of the fittest. It's kind of uh, alarming when you look at uh, the subtitle of Darwin's book, and I think I've got it here somewhere. His famous book in 19, or 1859, The Origin of Species. The subtitle underneath was this, The Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. The Preservation of the Favored Races. Racism. There's a problem with that. A big problem with that. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says this, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Isn't that great being a Christian? Isn't it good knowing the truth? That all men everywhere are equal. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're all of one blood. All nations all over. And God wants us to fill up the earth with humanity. Evolutionists want it the other way around. They view us as a plague upon the earth. And they think we should be like lower forms of animals and we should just let the others go by the wayside. I have a big problem. There are big problems, major holes, major problems in that theory of evolution. And we need to understand that. Now, the other thing is I want us to see this morning is that there are powers of creationism. Powers of creationism. Oh, where to begin with this topic? It's limitless. First of all, let's look at this. We have the support of the Bible. You see, creationists <clears throat> have this one book, you see, that, that uh, evolutionists do not have. And that one book is the Bible. It's the Word of God. We've got a, in this book from cover to cover, we have a presentation from God the Creator to His creation man. And it tells us everything. All the evolutionists have is a bunch of junked up theories written by a man who was disgruntled in the 1800s. And they keep changing and changing and changing their theory over and over and over again. We have the power of the Almighty God. We have the support of the Word of God. 2 Peter 1.16 says this, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. 
I like that. Has it seemed to you that maybe the evolutionists are just kind of spinning some kind of fables, some kind of cunningly devised fables? Sounds like it to me. I mean, they, 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 keep, they keep changing things all the time. And when you point out to them where they're wrong here and there, well, they, they'll change it over here. And they're, they're, they're just kind of making, it's like they're spinning a web of lies. But the Word of God's not so. It's completely different. You see, we have it written by men who were there. Men who had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the record in the book of Genesis that was written, authored by God, written by Moses, but it was authored by God, and God was there in the beginning. But the evolutionists don't have that. Now, scoffers may say, you know, the Bible is just a book written by men, and it is no better than Charles Darwin's book. That's what a lot of scoffers will say. But that's where they're wrong. And let me just give you a couple of examples this morning where they are wrong. First of all, as we look at it here, we'll see, and I'll get to the second point as well. Christ's resurrection proves that the Bible is the Word of God. After his resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us this. After his resurrection, hundreds of people have seen him at the same time. Hundreds of people. You ever look at some of these other religions that go on in the world today? Islam, the book that they use, it was written by a man who had a whole bunch of dreams. And he wrote them down. And he formed a religion out of it. We have Charles Darwin, similar fashion. It's just like a, any other religion. It's on evolution, how he can explain away God. Writes a book. It's just one man, writes a book. But with the Word of God, it's a little bit different than that. It's not just one person having a private interpretation about something. It's several men that were used over 1,600 years. That's 50 generations of men who didn't know each other. They couldn't collaborate. They couldn't conspire. They couldn't get together. See, even Charles Darwin was influenced by men in his day. He read the works and he, and he communicated and talked with other people who believed in an old earth. He was just the first one to write it down in his book, come up with a theory of evolution. But the men who wrote the Bible didn't know each other. For some 40 different men of 19 different occupations. We got shepherds there. We got kings. We got medical doctors, tax collectors, fishermen, men in the trades, men in the professions, men in royalty who would normally would never have any association with each other because they come from different worlds over periods of time. The Old Testament wrote, was written in the book or in the language of Hebrew and Aramaic. And then there's a 400 year period where there was nothing. And then the New Testament writes is written in a period of about 50 years in a new language called Greek. Different languages, different cultures, different generations. And yet in the one book, no contradictions. You put it together, no contradictions. No errors. The Bible has never had to retract a statement. Never once. You don't ever have to apologize for being a born-again Christian and believing in the Word of God. Evolutionists can't say that. Because Darwin's theory has been changed over and over and over again. They're changing it right now. I guarantee you somewhere in this world they're changing it. Due to the constraints we have today, it's, it's really difficult to look at all the proofs. But the second one there... It's the fact that the Bible's unique construction proves it. As I just said, it was constructed so, so interestingly over so many years that it is impossible for it to be the work of mankind. It is God who was behind the Bible. I think it's time for us Christians to get behind this and support God's Word and not let people change it, not let people question it. So we have the support of the Word of God. People actually saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came back from the dead like he said he would. His Word is sure. And the fact that there's no contradictions, no errors in the book tells us that we can trust it. But not only do we have the support of the Bible, we have the support of science and scientists. Do you know that there's actually born-again, Bible-believing scientists? You never see that on TV. There are people that have advanced degrees, that have Ph.D. degrees from all the secular universities that you can think of, and yet there are a lot of those 
who actually believe the Word of God, make a firm stand on it, and they do scientific research, and they write scientific papers on God's wonderful creation, but you'll never see them on TV. You never see them in the newspaper. You never see people lifting them up and carrying them around, praying them around with some new theory. They're always buried off to the side. I've said it before, we've been labeled pseudoscientists. Well, let me tell you something. Evolution is a pseudoscience. We just looked at it. You don't see life coming from death. Never. You don't see personality. You, man, with, with all his wisdom, cannot make a robot a personality. We've tried it. It doesn't work. Their theory doesn't hold water. It's a religion like any other religion, and it's a false one. We have the truth. And the scientists even, the Christian scientists who are open and honest about it, they support it, folks. We've got a lot of magazines that are being produced nowadays by Christians who are scientists. It's important to get them out. Maybe tonight, if I've got some time, I'll show you some of them. What I do sometimes after I've read them, what I'll do is I go to my doctor's office, my chiropractor's office, dentist's office, and I'll just leave them there. I see the other junk that they've got laying around. I'll leave them a magazine. Maybe somebody will pick it up and read it and be amazed at the creation that God has done. We have the support of scientists, as we're going to see, and it's quite, quite extensive. But one thing I want you to know is this. In the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, the late scientist Henry Morris wrote this, and I'll quote. He said, these references, he's talking about the book of Job, these references are modern in perspective, with never a hint of mythical exaggeration and errors characteristic of other ancient writings. Perhaps of even greater significance is the fact that in a 4,000-year-old book filled with numerous references to natural phenomena, there is no scientific mistakes or fallacies. That's quite a, a statement to be made by a scientist. But that's what he said. He said, boy, he said, I've looked at the book of Job, I've studied it out, and there's a lot of claims about natural phenomena. It's all supported by science. Oh, it took, it took hundreds of years, in some cases thousands of years since that book was written to prove them, but they're all been proven. And he gives examples. For example, the Bible in Job, chapter 26, verse 7, says that the earth is hung on nothing. It took us a while to figure that one out. It took us a while to get out there to prove that it was hung on nothing. It's not hanging on anything. See, all the other ancient religions say, so, well, you know, it's supported by this, it's supported by that, it's, somehow it's supported... Let me tell you something, Christians. Don't ever let evolutionists tell you that you're a, a flat earth society type of people. We're out there in the forefront. We knew the earth was round before the rest of the world knew the earth was round because it says so in the Bible. We knew that it wasn't hanging on anything. It's out there in space, placed the way God wanted it to be. We knew that. It was written 4,000 years ago in a book written by a man named Job. We're not believers in flat earth, and yet that's what I hear them say all the time. They get into this, this argument with you, and when they can't win the argument, they say, oh, you're a bunch of flat earth people. No, we're not. The book of Job. In that book, it tells us the air has weight. It does. And you know what? We've discovered that air has weight. There's a column of air right now pushing down on each and every one of us. We feel it's, it's pressure. It tells us that the earth rotated in Job chapter 38, verse 12 and 14. That gives us the night and day. It tells you that. If only we would read it. It tells us that light creates wind, and it does. It describes the hy hydrological cycle and, and how, how it moves around and how, how the, the oceans have currents. It talks about how the the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, the, the water and the, and the air, how they work together. And you know what we've discovered through science? Is that the planet Earth is so unique. The way that our water and our air work together and cycle, right to the nth degree that it supports life. Because if it was off just a little bit, we wouldn't be here today. It tells us that in the book of Job. Job. So we have that one, the book of Job. But we also have, what about the other books? I'm glad you asked. Because the other books support it too. We could go on and on and on. We got Leviticus. The pastors mentioned this one many times. Levitic, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, where it says that the life is in the blood. You know, if, if only George Washington, the first president of the United States, would have realized that. He, he was a person that practiced bloodletting there, where he believed it, 
you know, if he was ill, he had bad blood, so he better let some blood out. Ultimately, it contributed to his death. But why won't people listen to the Bible? Because science, when it's studied out, points it back and says, well, you know what? It's right. It's right. We're on the winning side, and I like that. So we could go on with many things. The Bible also says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41, it says that the stars have their glory. And in fact, they do. If you were to look at stars, they used to believe many, many years ago, they used to believe that the light stars, the little teeny weeny stars, were the stars that are furthest away. And the bigger stars, well, they're the stars that are closest to us. But the Bible says that each star has its own glory. And what they discovered is that some of the stars that are so big and bright, they're farther away than the little ones. Each star is unique, just like people are unique. The Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians. It's funny how it takes, you know, a few thousand years to, to prove it, but it does. Science, you give it time, science will always support the Bible. I am so glad. That's why I'm so firm on this stuff, because I've never had to apologize for what I believe, as long as, long as I stick with the Bible. The only time I get in trouble is when I leave the Bible. So, there's ample proof through creation that God is there. He exists, and that He is the Creator. And in fact, every month, there are new articles, scientific articles, being produced that support and promote the fact that the Earth was created just maybe between six, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, within six literal days. There's proof of that, scientific proof of that. Lots of it. Lots of it out there. So my point is, I guess, with all of this, if that's true, if it's true that there are problems with evolution and there's the powers of creationism, why can't we make them see? In other words, why can't we make the evolutionists understand? And the answer is remarkably simple. That answer is because it is not within our power to do so. Now, if you've got your Bibles there again, Romans chapter 1. I don't believe we read this one. Verse 16. Paul writing here, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's not within our power to make them see. It's up to the power of God to make them see. You say, where does the power of God come from? It comes from the power of the cross, doesn't it? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The debate between creationists and evolutionists is not a debate of science. It is a war between two opposing faiths. Standing in the center is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But for a man to believe the gospel, he must first accept the Creator. Before you get to the Savior, before you get to the cross, before you get to Jesus, you have to go back to Genesis and you have to accept Him as Creator. And by accepting such a Creator, man must acknowledge his lowliest state as a helpless sinner. And that's difficult. I know. Before I got saved, before I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I heard the, the gospel, and I knew it was true. But you know, I didn't get saved right away. I had a struggle. I had to come down, and I had to admit that I was a, a lowly, helpless sinner. And that's not easy for a person with pride to do. So we have that. The most difficult thing you're going to find is that a person has to willingly submit to a holy God. Very difficult. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, we looked at some of this here. It said, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful. Isn't that awful? There, that means there was a time when individuals, that was, there was a time when nations knew God. They knew Him. They knew He existed. But they, they just didn't want to have Him. They didn't want to be thankful. They didn't want to glory in him. Verse 22 goes on, it says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? They became fools. You know, an atheist is a religion of fools. 
Skipping down to verse 25, it says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Why can't we make them see? Because it is not within our power to make them see. It is not man's struggle with our logic that prevents them from seeing the Creator. It is man's struggle with God and God's Word that prevents them. It is a battle of faith. And that leads to a reprobate mind. Now, a reprobate mind means this. It means that the mind is unfit. For these people who have said no to God, I'm not going to retain God in my, in my mind anymore. I'm not going to think about Him. <clears throat> I'm not going to give Him the credit for anything. I'm going to take the credit for it. I'm not going to give Him any praise, any glory. I'm going to shut Him out of my mind. God says, okay, that's fine. You could do that. Because I've given you a free will. You have a personality. But let me tell you this. I'm going to just give you up. In other words, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with you. I'm going to leave you on your own. Your mind is going to become unfit. And you're not going to be able to understand the truth, even though it's staring you right there in the face. Why can't these evolutionists believe in God, even though all the evidence points toward God? Because they've been given over to an unfit, a reprobate mind. It's right there in front of them. But they can't see it. And yet a, a Christian, a young boy or a girl can understand it. It's so simple. And yet these, these, these intelligent people who are so eloquent in their speeches, they cannot understand this. A reprobate mind. Unfit. God provides ample proof, if only we would listen. Let me close today with, uh, with an example of what happens when you let things slide. We're going to look at the story of Charles Templeton. Maybe you know him, heard of him. He was born in Canada in 1915. He was an evangelical leader with great zeal. Templeton rose to prominence, even surpassing another dynamic preacher by the name of Billy Graham. Greater than Billy Graham, can you imagine? More zealous than Billy Graham. A greater preacher than Billy Graham. People listen to him. He was a contemporary of Graham's. In 1946, he was listed among those best used of God by the National Assemblies of Evangelicals. And he pastored a rapidly growing church in Toronto called Avenue Road Church that he started with just his family and a few friends. And within a short period of time, it, grow, it grew to hundreds of people. What a man he was. What an orator. What a communicator he was. He even toured with the famous Billy Graham. And they toured all around North America and Europe and preached and saw thousands of people saved come over to the Lord's side. In Evans, Indiana, the total attendance over the two-week campaign that he had was 91,000 people. In the last 25 years since I've been preaching, you were at anybody up, I would even come up anywhere near that. He did it in two weeks. And that town only had a population of 128,000 people. However, despite his popularity as a great evangelist, all was not well with Charles Templeton. Templeton's lack of formal education had troubled him, and he was encouraged by other people to seek higher education. At the same time, he was starting to develop doubts in the Bible. He started to question. He started to read it, and he started to see what was going on in the Bible. He started to look what was going on out in, in life. And he was starting to hear about evolution. And he was starting to have doubts. 1948, he went off to school. He began pursuing a theology degree at Princeton Theological Seminary problem is most of the professors there were evolutionists. Even the theological professors believed in evolution and they were promoting it. And so he went to a place where he would have thought, boy, he could get alone and with other people 
<clears throat> and he could glory in God and he could study God formally and study the Bible and get into all kinds of things. But the opposite was true. He was taught evolution. He was, he was taught in, in an environment where they tried to poke holes in the Word of God. And after graduating from Princeton, Templeton accepted a position with the National Council of Churches. And he even had a very popular TV show, a Christian TV show at that time. However, he faced increasingly uh, increasing health problems because he could not reconcile this debate and this struggle that was going on inside of him. You see, he had the Bible on one side, he had evolution on the other, and they didn't work together. And it was eating him apart inside. He started having chest pains. He got ill. And eventually he had to make a decision, and he made a decision, and he chose to leave the ministry. Templeton, like Charles Darwin, had a big problem with understanding how when you look out in life and you see the struggles and you see death and disease and all the turmoil that people go through, and he couldn't understand how the God of the Bible, the loving God, could have created all that. If only institutions like Princeton Theological Seminary, like the churches at that time, could have just stood true to the Word of God, not compromised it, and, and really got through to this man's mind and heart that the reason we have death and disease today is not because of a loving God. It's because of a sinful man. If only he could have saw the cross where a loving God did come down to a man that didn't deserve it and gave up his own son to bear a curse for us. Things might have been different. Can you imagine what this man could have done if he would have been used by God instead of ripped apart by evolutionism? In 1996, a book was published by Charles Templeton entitled Farewell to God. And he concludes this, and I'll, I'll quote him. He said, I believe that there is no supreme being with hu human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that all life is the result of timeless evolutionary forces over millions of years. Another quote, he says, I believe that in common with all living creatures, we cease to exist when we die as an entity. Isn't that sad? A man that preached the the gospel, who had it in his grasp, thousands saved, dies with a reprobate mind. Would you bow your heads close your eyes, please? No one looking around this morning? Now, we have looked at the problems of evolutionism. We have looked at the powers of creationism, and we have concluded with an example of one who just could not see. One who trusted in the wisdom of man and shun the power of God to the cross. We ask ourselves the question, why can't we make them see the, the Creator? And of course, the Bible is answered because they have rejected God's holy word. An evolutionist cannot be debated into believing God as Creator, the same way as an atheist cannot be debated into believing that God the Son is the Savior. This is a spiritual war that we are fighting. Schools, universities, governments have abandoned their God. As a result, God has given them up to a reprobate mind, an in, unfit way of reasoning. Now what about you? Have institutions and the media, have they been pressuring you to abandon the faith? Have they caused you to question God's word? God's word is sure. God's word is proven. Many theories have changed over the years. I've read about them even in recent years, changing and changing again. But God's word, the Bible, has never once had to apologize or retract a statement. What you do with this message is up to you. Perhaps you have someone in mind who's struggling with evolution in the Bible, whether it's true or not. You cannot argue them into the kingdom of God. You can't do it. But you can pray for them. And you can provide scripture and support for the word of God. With a show of hands, how many would say here this morning, Brother MacDonald, I am saved. I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. Would you just slip up your hand? 
as a testimony. Amen. Amen. Hands up all over this room today. You can put them down. Thank you. Let me ask you this. Is there someone here this morning who would say, Brother McDonald, I am not 100% sure. If I was to die right now, I am not 100% sure where I would go. Would you just slip up that up as a hand up as a testimony of that? I'd like to pray for you. I won't call you up. Is there someone here? I am not sure. If I was to die right now, where would I go? I've been listening to evolutionists and, I, and I'm confused. But I'd like to know. Okay. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation to give you an opportunity to come forward to have someone help you by taking the Bible and showing you how you can accept Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're also going to have an invitation for born-again Christians to come forward. If there's somebody that you need to pray for, then I urge you to do it this morning because we are fighting a fight that we can win if we let the Lord fight for us. It's not going to be your wisdom that does it. It's not going to be your argument. It's not going to be the way you debate it. It's going to be the power of God that does it. And that means you've got to get down on bend and knee and pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the fact that we are on the winning side. Thank you for the confidence that we have. Not confidence within ourselves, not pride within ourselves, but we can glory in a God who is sure, a God who stands the test of time, a God who is eternal. Now, Father, we do pray for those who are without. We pray for those who have doubts. We have, pray for those people, even those people with with the reprobate mind, Lord, that you would soften the hearts, get into those minds, help them to see clearly the truth that is in God. And for those who are teetering on, the, on the, the brink of being saved or going to a lost eternity, Lord, we pray for their salvation, for their souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please?